All right, let's get started with our October Power Hour. Um, welcome to the Power Hour. This is a monthly interview series featuring leaders from the front lines of the fight for gender justice. I'm Dr. Caroline Heldman, the Executive Director of the Representation Project, and I am thrilled to be joined today by my co-host, Sydney Quarry. Sydney is a film professional, and she has a lot of experience working at organizations, including the Representation Project, uh, Film Independent, and A24. Sydney is currently working in documentary development at Concordia Studios. Take it away, Sydney. Hi, everyone. Um, so just a little overview of the Power Hour if you're new here. Um, so the Power Hour is a monthly interview series that features extraordinary influential change makers. And the purpose of this series is to bring the wisdom of activists and thought leaders to inspire you to take action. And today we're joined by Sheetal Sheth. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm just going to jump into her bio so you can get a sense of all of the amazing work that she's doing. So Sheetal is an acclaimed actress, producer, author, and activist known for her provocative performances in a wide range of memorable roles on film and television. Sheetal burst on the scene with raves in the groundbreaking film ABCD and slam dance winner American Chai. She broke out and won hearts in looking for comedy in the Muslim world opposite Albert Brooks as a female lead, Maya, winning the role after an extensive international casting search. Sheetal has become a favorite in the independent film world. That's one of my favorite worlds. <laughs> she won uh, three Best Actress nods on the festival circuit for the world unseen, one for her role in The Wings of Hope, and most recently for Grin, which she also produced. In 2012, fans voted her favorite movie actress in After Ellen's Visibility Awards. To date, she has starred in over 20 feature films and has earned a loyal international following. She is currently on post-production on the feature film Hummingbird. Uh, Chef began her career at a time when very few South Asians were making a living as actors, and despite being told she'd have to change her name to work, her successful career has trailblazed paths for other women of color across media. She supports marginalized communities, not only through her own pioneering work as an actor, but also by appearing at workshops and panels and speaking directly to issues facing those communities. Sheetal has represented brands such as Reebok and Chi Hair Care and has appeared on the cover of magazines including Anoki, um, Women International. Oh, you've appeared on a lot. I'm trying to cover them all. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey and Seema. She's known as an outspoken advocate and has delivered talks and keynotes at festivals and charity galas. She's had op-eds published on CNN and Thrive Global. She served in President Clinton's AmeriCorps and currently on the advisory board of Equality Now. Her extensive background in working with kids led her into the world of children's literature and her first children's book, Always Angeli, was published in 2018 to wide acclaim. It won 2019's Purple Dragonfly Storybook Grand Prize, voted on by teachers and librarians, and is set to be a series. So that was amazing. That list was incredible. Thank you for reading all of that. My goodness, a, a lot. lot to cover. <laughs> okay, we can shorten it. <laughs> so obviously you have an incredible track re record of activism and entertainment. So how do you balance the two and what role do you think entertainers should play in social justice work? I mean, it's interesting when I think about it, I don't know how to separate it. Um, I grew up just always loving community and being very involved in community. My parents, you know, were one of the first people of color in our neighborhood and created community centers. And I was in charge of the youth club. And so like, I've always been involved in community in some way, shape or form, advocating, speaking up, like the representative on our school board that was the student from the school, that was always me. Um, so I don't know how not to be, so it's not like one of those things where I'm like later in life, I found it. It's something that's just who I am. It's in my DNA, it's in my blood. Um, and so when projects come to me, it's probably because that's the stuff I'm drawn to. 
um, when I'm reading scripts, the stuff that I end up wanting to do have layers of something more under it. Um, and those are the ones, not that I, I mean, and, and I'm also about fun and obviously it being entertaining and accessible. Cause I think that's the key is making them all kind of work on, on together. Um, but I seem when I look at my track record of my movies, there's clearly a pattern. And I think it's just probably that's what I'm drawn to. <laughs> so she told you entered Hollywood and independent films, that whole scene uh, when there were very few women of color who were prominently featured. Uh, we have seen some positive movement along those lines, long ways to go, uh, especially for certain marginalized groups. Um, I'm wondering what experiences you have had as uh, an Indian American woman in Hollywood and what you've seen change over the years. Well, I remember so vividly when I graduated NYU, I went to the acting school there, which is a great school. Uh, I loved it, but I was very much in a bubble and I was not prepared for what the real like business part of acting was. And I was really stunned by the, like, I'll just repeat the conversation that I had multiple times. Go in, hi, what's your name? Sheetal Chef. What? Sheetal. Oh yeah, you're gonna have to change that. And that happened all the time. And not just like from inter introductory meetings, but I would be in an audition situation where it would be like my fourth callback and the casting director would come to me and say, just so you know, you're the producer's number one choice. The director loves you, but they really need you to change one of your names in order to get the part. And that happened a lot. And so, and clearly I didn't, and I didn't get the role. I actually didn't think that they would actually, that they meant it, but I didn't get the role. Um, and so, you know, I think now we have we we're talking about these things. We have social media. I started in the nineties. We didn't have any of the tools we have now. If any of those things had happened to me in say 2021, I could easily have like talked about it. And the social media kind of, you know, army would be able to be there to back me up. But there were so many things like that that happen on a regular basis that it almost gets to a point where you don't even like you cannot give it as much weight. And it's, I will tell you, it's not until recently in the last couple of years with the conversations that we're having, I was actually just telling my husband that a lot is flooding back to me. And I feel like there's a lot of just like little bits of trauma that we've experienced just being a woman um, in the industry since the nineties that I just was like, I remember feeling like, what am I going to do? Get upset over everything that happens every day. That means I'll be able, like, it's like 15 things. You, know? you can't. I couldn't. And so a lot of it is coming back to me now in a way because I'm reading stories, I'm hearing people's stories. And so a lot of the stuff that I dealt with, which I didn't think as much about, but were inappropriate, not okay, completely insensitive, completely wrong. Um, you know, so in that sense, I think we're it's it's a better place to talk about this stuff, but we see still, you know, when people share their stories. They're, they're, it's not as simple as you think like, okay, everyone will believe you. Um, I remember being, this is before, you know, like the digital world, one of the few people, cause there were very, very few South Asian actors in the nineties. There was like 10 of us and we all knew each other. And we used to say, can we at least be the doctors? Because we're, we're, we're 30%, I think we were like, I don't know, whatever percentage of the population, but 33% of all the doctors. I was like, can you at least give us that? And I remember writing a handwritten letter <laughs> that we all signed and sent it to ER. Cause we were like, that was the big show at the time. And we were like, can we at least get that? And then they, then they did, they hired Perminder after Bendit like Beckham. And so now what's funny is you see like, we're at least the doctor. And so, you know, in over 20 years, like, okay, we'll get the doctor. But the point is, can we just be people and the narratives not be about our ethnicity and all of us should be able to play all the roles. Um, and so that's really what I think we need to, to get to, you know. Yeah, and you have, so you have a background in independent film and you just mentioned ER, which is a bit more mainstream. Yeah. So do you think that, uh, there's a difference between um, what's available out there between those two? Like, is there more access in independent film 
or entertainment versus like what everyone is kind of consuming on TV right now? hundred percent. I mean, that's what gave me the ability to work on the kinds of roles that I was able to. I wasn't going to get, I wasn't getting those roles because they were given it to, you know, I could name a, a number of, of women that we all are very familiar um, that we know very well because they were getting, they weren't going to cast someone who looked like me in those, in the lead roles of these stories. And so, but the independent films would, they would take a chance. They would think about it and be a little bit more open and inclusive. Um, but, you know, when you're dealing with the, the studios and the networks and a lot of people that all look the same making these decisions and don't realize that actually they're hurting their pocketbooks, they think that they're doing it for the bottom line. But I think we've all proven that casting people of color and hiring people of color actually increases their bottom line. And that's something that I think people are finally realizing. So shifting back to your book, um, <clears throat> apologies. <laughs> so uh, your book seems to have a lot of layers. Um, I think I'm actually shifting a little bit too forward with your book. Let's, let's go back. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, kind of pivoting to media. I think there's a lot to discuss there in terms of entertainment and film. So what do you think is needed in order to make um, real change in the media landscape? I don't think it's enough that you hire us. I think we need to be in charge. I think that we need to be able to make the bigger decisions because what happens is you see, and, I, and I'm experiencing it now, is you, know, you get the things kind of optioned or the things greenlit or in development, but you're still coming up against the kind of higher ups that all look the same and are kind of a bit of the old guard. And, and a lot of them are trying to do the right thing, but they don't know how. And so what I always like to say is like, you've trusted me enough to like bring me on to do this. So then let me just do it. Let me just trust me. Like I know this world, I know what I'm doing. So let us do it. Also give us the money that you would give everybody else. Because what happens is the budgets, the marketing, the PR, all of that, as we all know, make a difference in the success of something. And so again, it's not enough to just be like, oh, I, I optioned that, I made that, I put that into development. No, give us the resources too, let us succeed. Give all of, all of us the same things that you give to all the other um, people. And then also when it comes, and I'll speak of just for my community, when it comes to narratives that have to do with a South Asian person, please take us out of the, the like four narratives that you guys seem to only wanna give us. And I'll say that they're arranged marriage um poverty mythology or religion like or terrorism and I'm just like we also which is what my books do I'm like we also like play sports and play instruments and did you know we eat dinner with our parents like you do you know <laughs> like it's 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 so interesting the stuff that you see over and if you think about what you've seen with Indian people those are the narratives mm -hmm. and so I just urge you to people to like, not you, but like people to um, think about that in the sense of like, what are you putting out there? Because what we should be doing is showing what we all have much more in common than otherizing us and making it seem like we're here to have to prove our existence to people and like yeah. explain who we are. <laughs> Thank you, Sheetal. I and mean, that was a great overview of tropes that we're all unfortunately really familiar with, right? Because you're right, that's yep. what we see again and again. And you had mentioned your book and the role that your books are playing in this. I know you just uh, published your second children's book. Can you talk about the significance of this series uh, and maybe read us an excerpt from your latest Yes, book? <laughs> I will. So the very first book, Always Anjali, which is behind my head, um, came out a few years ago and as you heard my story, it's very much about this girl who wants to change her name to quote, fit in. Um, and it comes very much from my life, my friends' lives, so many people that I know lives. And I realized that when I was like thinking about what the narrative was gonna be, the kids are still dealing with this. Kids are still broadly dealing with feeling like they need to change themselves in any capacity. For Anjali, she feels like it's her name. But when I talk to kids, there's so many parts of themselves that they don't feel like work or fit and so the story the message is really you don't have to change anything about yourself you're perfect and then you know when we wrote the book we didn't know when I when, when I got it when I sold it and it was published I didn't know how it was going to do it's done really well so I got to write more books and then found out that this Anjali series 
is the only illustrated book series in this age group that actually has a South Asian American hero. Like it doesn't exist. Again, not shocking, but it is not surprising, but it is shocking in this again, 2021. So it just tells you like, as far as we've come, we still have so far to go. Like this shouldn't be something we have to keep like all the first, well, this, she's the first who did this. She's the, I want to get to the point where we're not like, it's just, it's just what we see and what we're accustomed to. And so in the follow-up, Bravo Anjali, which is what it's called, Anjali deals with being the only girl in the room. And, and she navigates a friendship with this boy that's her good friend. She plays the tabla, which is a predominantly male dominated instrument. And she's the only girl in her class and she's the best. And the other kids give her a hard time for it. And so she starts messing up on purpose. And then I'm just giving you a bit summary. So then I read this part that we get up to. So then she, there's, she's dealing with all of her big feelings and realizes with the help of another girl that she should never dim her light. And right before this big contest that's coming up when she's deciding what she's gonna do, I'm gonna read you a little bit of it. Um, this is what happens. It was the day of the recital and the hall was buzzing. Anjali was in the bathroom trying to calm her nerves. She had decided that she may not win the contest, but she was going to do her very best. She thought about the first time she ever saw someone playing tabla. His hands and the beautiful sounds he was creating had mesmerized her so much she had come home and made her own tabla set out of old yogurt containers. She wasn't going to let anyone make her feel bad for being good at something, especially something as much, something that she loved as much as tabla. Those are those pages. She dreamed of a moment like this. She reviewed the compositions in her mind and looked at herself in the mirror. I can do this. So that's and then she goes on to do something. <laughs> and you can read the book and you can imagine what happens, but um, that's a little piece of it. It's beautiful. Very beautiful. Thank you. Um, that feels like a, an affirmation, maybe that, um, I don't wanna get into the whole process of, you know, um, maybe I will, <laughs> but that just speaking those words as like a young woman, that's very impactful. So for young girls to have that access, that's amazing um, and kind of leads into the next question. So this seems to be a bit more than just like a children's book, obviously. Um, there's more kind of behind the message. So um, was that your intention and what did you, how did you decide to write about that? Yes, very much. I found that when I started having kids and just turned my attention more to children's literature, that it was all very similar narrative. Um, and they didn't talk about real things. And I think the kids want to talk about real things. I think our kids want in and they really do like they're like my kids, all the kids I meet are so happy that I'm talking about real things. And so I think for me, it was like, how can I talk about those real things, but also keep it fun and accessible and also beautiful and, and the experience of a children's book. And maybe by the end of it, oh, wait, what was that message? What was that theme? Something deeper. And that's why my books are, yes, like this age group is four to nine, but like I have teenagers that I'm doing sessions with because the themes of them resonate. And obviously if you're older, you can take deeper conversations from, from the narratives that I bring up. But I mean, it's funny when I get a little bit of pushback from people sometimes, I'm like, guys, what I always say, our kids are being gunned down in our schools. They have to do lockdown drills. There are bulletproof backpacks, bulletproof backpacks that you're trying to get them to buy. And you're telling me we can't talk to our kids about racism, bullying, and misogyny. You got to be kidding me. And so that usually shuts people down. Um, and I, and one step further is always say, there's no better place to talk to our kids about this than in the lap of someone you love. And that's usually how you're reading a book with your kids. It's like all snuggled up, opening the book, and then you can have these conversations. The only way we are going to get to a place where we don't have like the leaders we have now doing the same dumb things over and over again, and clearly not good leaders or communicators is to get our kids in on the conversations as early as possible. So Sheetal, you have told a lot of stories in a lot of different ways that have big impact when it comes to social justice, right? So um, being one of the uh, very few and first um, Indian American women in cinema, 
uh, in the United States, uh, as well as your children's books. You've also told really impactful stories about, and this is a big shift, but surviving cancer and that struggle. Um, why did you talk to us about what about that story, right? Because it's pretty distinct. It's very personal. Um, tell us about that story and that struggle and what you wish people knew about that. Um, I decided to talk about it publicly because I realized that, again, enough of us don't. It struck me when I was young and I was shocked. I mean, still, I can't believe that I had cancer, um, especially because on paper, I'm really healthy and I do all the things you're supposed to be doing. So number one, it can happen to anybody. Like there is no rhyme or reason. Number two, thank God I had been taking care of myself because it could have been a lot worse and it was pretty serious. Number three, do not, do not put off your exams and really pay attention to your body. And a, a, a recent statistic I just learned is that one in three women put off their exams over COVID because of obvious reasons. And that breaks my heart because I think about how many women will be missing their diagnoses at the early, earlier times because of that. So please don't put that off. Like it's so, I found it. I found the cancer myself because I know my body and I didn't think it was cancer, but I went and got it checked out. Thank God. Um, and also this idea of, um, I, I find that my community, the South Asian community doesn't talk about certain topics and illness is very taboo. Um, and it's something that I grew up with and I just thought it was so stupid. And really, really just, I mean, stupid's really the only word to describe it because, you know, the idea of not having community and sisterhood and, and people around you that you can talk to and share this that hopefully can make it easier for anybody or easier for myself as I was going through it. My, I'm part of a support group, a specifically young breast cancer survivor support group. And that has been the most amazing way for me to process and there's and it's there in whatever shape I needed at the time um so I don't know if I answered your question I'm trying to think if I did <laughs> well that's really great like you're you're busting some narratives um yeah who talks it's about okay it. yep. we got to talk about it you know and I you know I will say to be honest I didn't talk about it for at least six months after my diagnosis because I wasn't ready I was still it was a lot you know, and my kids were babies and, you know, this is not a disease that generally affects younger people, although it does. Um, now it's this, the latest statistic is one in eight women will get breast cancer. So when you think of your network, one in eight, so you're going to know a lot of people that have it. And so, but it usually comes a little bit older. So, and your kids are older and the experience is different. But my kids were babies and it was, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really inspiring to hear that that you're encouraging people to be a bit more vocal in communities where they're they're not. Um, so I was wondering, what are you working on next? What's next for you? Thank you. Yes. So I'm in post production on a film called Hummingbird, which I'm really excited about. It's a fantasy genre film that I also produced, and I'm in it. We have an amazing cast, amazing director. We're in post and hopefully we can start kind of trickling into the world next year. Let's see. Um, I also have the third Anjali book is coming out next year. And I have two other books that I've written. One of which um, was just announced. It's called Making Happy. And it's a children's book about a family that's going through illness. Because when I was going through my cancer, and looking for children's books. And I would go into these stores. I'm like, give me all your books about illness and death. And the, like the few that were there, again, no one wanting to talk about it. Um, we're all very abstract, like stories about like the empty chair that's supposed to represent something, you know, all this stuff that I'm like are beautiful in theory, but like kids just want to hear stories. They want to hear substantive things that can actually make them like give credence to the feelings that they're having. And so I wrote this book called Making Happy, which is very much about making happy in the moments of everything we're going through in this context. It's his, her mom got sick, this little girl. Um, and when I was shopping it around, it was so interesting. Like the amount of editors were like, we just want to cheer kids up. And I'm like, well, I do too, by the way. And my book is a very hopeful, optimistic book, but it deals with a real thing. And who doesn't deal with illness in their life? 
And there's a huge segment of the population. And then I did find an amazing editor who got it. She was like, this book doesn't exist. I can't believe it doesn't exist. There's a huge hole in the market. And thank you for writing it. And, and, and we have an amazing illustrator. And so that's going to be out next year. And it's beautiful. And I, that book is probably the most personal. And so every time I see the roughs or the illustrations, I'm like weeping. I'm like, okay, I just wait. I need a few days before I can give my notes <laughs> because it's, um, it's really beautiful. And they've done an amazing job of what I wanted in the sense of I wanted it to be very hopeful, but I wanted it to be honest and to get those layers so that kids could really feel all those things um, is hard, but, they're, but the illustrator's doing it. So I'm excited. So you're working on yet another impactful, right, using storytelling for social change in all of these different ways. Um, last question of the Power Hour before we open it up to questions. And yes, folks, <clears throat> you should be posting your questions now for Sheetal. Um, the, the question we love to, to ask people um, on the Power Hour is, if you had a magic wand, what would you do uh, to advance the world in terms of social justice? Well, there's a lot of things, but if let me think like what I will tell you and not to get like so nuts and boltsy, but I really believe this. Um, if we could just make every position in government have term limits, I feel like our world could be really different. And I mean like all of Congress, Supreme Court, all of these jobs that have now become so politicized and lifetime, you know, career things, which I don't think anyone intended. And I think they talk about it when you look at the old founders kind of papers. That's why they gave the president term limits, but nobody else. because They didn't think anybody would make this their career long life. So I do think bringing in new voices and new blood and allowing them to have a shot at doing something because I think our future is bright when you see the, the young people out there, but they don't have the opportunities and the access. So I do think term limits all around and paying our teachers a whole lot more, like a lot more. <laughs> like It should be one of the most highest paying jobs that are available out there, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, absolutely. We need to put our money where our mouth is and, and do it. Uh, yeah, it's it's fascinating how nobody, uh, well, a lot of people will um, talk talk about that job and the difficulty, right, and what it what it entails, um, and yet we don't value it, right? And we get into this a little bit in the Great American Lie, which is the third film that we put out from the Representation <clears throat> Project, Jennifer Siegel Newsom, obviously directing, um, which really digs into that, right? The fact that we don't value the care economy, uh, and that includes teachers. We don't value women's work. Um, yep. And in fact, when women move into professions, they become devalued. Um, Sheetal, you are an absolute inspiration. And I know I said that was the last question and we do have some questions in the chat. Um, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit on a personal level, given everything you're doing. You're doing, uh, you know, tele you're doing film, maybe television. Uh, you're writing children's books. Um, you are a cancer survivor. You're an activist. Um, what is your, so for folks who are interested in being effective in these various, you know, juggling everything, um, what is your approach? How do you manage your schedule? Like, what is your, do you have a, like a take on life that helps you get all of this in? Uh, I only do things that I care about. Um, and I say no a lot. Um, and I've, I've said it more than ever in the last few years. I was really, really bad at self-care, which is probably one of the reasons why, you know, things in my life ended up the way they were in terms of illness. Um, I, I didn't know how to take care of myself. I did not set boundaries. And I was, I, I always felt, especially as an actress, that like, I've got to be available at any time because that's my shot. That's my only shot, you know, and the industry tells you that the industry makes you feel that way. And I put so much of my life off. So I always say, don't wait for your life to start. Don't put that thing off because you want to do something else. Like, your life is only gonna become more enriched and deeper if you have all these other things. And so all of my creative outlets are just as important to me. You know, I didn't know how I was gonna feel with the children's books, but it has brought me so much joy, which is why I have so many other books now come because I don't ever wanna stop. I love it. I love it so much. And I love telling stories in all these different mediums. So I say set boundaries, say no, only do the things that you really wanna do because at the end of the day, life, is not promised. And so you wanna feel like if you if you can, and I realize that even saying that is, is a privileged thing to say, um, but create a world in which that can happen. And I will tell you for me, as somebody 
who did not have money and the privilege of doing that when I started, I made a very early choice when I started out and I moved to LA to bartend and I bartended for 10 years. I bartended while I was making movies. I would go to a premiere of my movie and then go back to the bar the next night because I never wanted to take a job for the money. And so I think there are ways to create your reality um, if you're open to doing it. Mm. Wow, that's a great story. Okay, so hopefully you'll write that in your memoir at some point. <laughs> um, I have a question, a personal question as an entertainment junkie. Um, what are you watching? What do you recommend? What should we keep in, who should we keep an eye out for? Good question. Oh my gosh. I, you know, what's so funny, Sydney, is now I get irritated when some, you can't binge something because I, you know, we obviously grew up in a way where you just watch things episodically, but now that it's become a binge culture, if I start to watch something and I can't finish it, I get very irritated. So I, I wait if there's like, if there's a show like Ted Lasso that is doing it episodically, I wait, I haven't even seen the second season because I'm like, I can't, I need to just wait till they're all out there and I'll watch it all at the same time. Um, because I, again, have li limited time. So I just want to like zip through them when I'm ready to do it and find out what happens. What am I watching now? So I did love Ted Lasso, obviously, I mean, who didn't the first season um, and the morning show, which I love. I haven't watched either of the second seasons yet for this, for those reasons. Um, I loved Mayor of Easttown. I loved an Amazon show. I don't know. I don't know why people aren't, maybe they are talking about it, but I hadn't heard it. It's a show that Lena Waithe executive produced called Them. And it is, it's hard to watch, it is, but it's a really, it's a, it's a horror, it's horror genre and it's about the 50s, about this black family who moves into a white neighborhood and what happens to them. And it's really powerful and the performances are amazing and it's, it is hard to watch, but when you think about how much of that is based in some sort of reality, it's horrifying which I think is the point of it. So I really, I, I, I zipped, I could not wait to finish that. Um, but again, I'm warning you, it's not, it's not easy to watch. Um, I loved um, Mayor of Easttown. I loved uh, Lovecraft Country. I loved, I mean, I watch everything, I will say, because I feel like I need to know what's happening. In terms of the films out right now, I actually have not seen any. I've been basically just watching stuff available because I'm not going <laughs> anywhere because I do have small children. So I haven't been in any theaters, but I am. I know there's like a whole slew of new movies probably coming out, but um, it's mostly TV and stuff that I can I can binge. I'm trying to think. There's probably a bunch of other ones that I I missed, but that's what's on the top of my mind at the moment. That's yeah. a great list. A yeah. great list. <laughs> Uh, there are some folks who are saying pay our teachers well, yes. Also, uh, <laughs> one person says term limits, yes, and also outlaw gerrymandering. Um, so we'll politically geek out there, yes. Um, <laughs> and there's a question from Adriana. Uh, what differences, sorry, there are more questions coming in. Let me scroll back up. What differences do you see between your generation and your kids' generation, considering that there are people like you who are fighting for diverse and meaningful representation and storytelling? Well, I will tell you the fact that like my kids have these books or like my friend's kids have these books and not just mine, but there are other books too. I'm not just saying that. Um, ish, I didn't have that. Like I literally consumed all white media while I was growing up. And so it's so interesting to me when people say to me like, oh, my, my favorite thing is when someone says when they hear about my books, oh my God, I have an Indian friend that I would love to buy this for. And I'm like, great, what about you? <laughs> it's like so fascinating to me it's like me meeting an Indian person asking what their favorite Indian restaurant is I'm sure that's happened to to people um anyone who's listening if you're of a specific background all of a sudden you're an expert on everything in that background um but the point is I grew up consuming literally probably predominantly 90 percent of white of all white media and I liked the shows and I related because again you can and so to then to say that you can't read a book with someone who doesn't look like you um, is so narrow-minded, you know? And so I think it's up to us as parents to make sure that our libraries and our homes reflect the world as they are and make it so that like my kids don't know a world where these books don't exist. And that's amazing. Now I'm panicked that they're four and seven right now. 
that when they're in their 20s that they're going to be having the same fight, like still fighting about things that I can't believe we're still fighting about. I have friends of mine's parents who like marched in the 70s for women's rights and they're like, I cannot believe I'm still fighting for this. I'm not going to say the word. Um, so I really, I hope that continues and I hope that they don't, that, that they can get onto the bigger things that do deserve debate because I do feel like we waste a lot of time debating things that should be no-brainers. Amen. Yes, that is so powerful. Um, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that was the most amazing note to possibly end on. <laughs> so um, wrapping it up there, where can people find your book? Where can they support you, find you on social media? Yes, thank you. Um, you can get the books anywhere books are sold. It's readily available on Amazon, Bookshop, Indie, Bound, all of those places. And then your bookstore, if you want to support your local bookstore, if they don't have it in stock, they can order it and send it to you. Um, so I always say encourage people to do that, which is great. It also tells those bookstores to keep more in stock because people want it. Um, and then you can find me, my, my website is shetolchef.com. It's just my name. And that's kind of a, like a home base. You can find my Instagram and my Twitter and I get all of my kind of handles and see everything I'm up to um, through there. And say hi. Let me know what you think. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, that was uh, powerful. I'm going to be thinking about that for two hours, even after <laughs> we hop off. Um, but thank you so much for being here. And uh, for everyone watching, the Power Hour is out every first Thursday of the month. So tune back in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.